welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this lecture on the thought of Jacques Maritain as it relates to education. <clears throat> In a course on education philosophy, there are certainly very many authors one might read with benefit. Oftentimes, however, and as you may already have experienced, the thinkers we are required to study and who are lauded as the big shooters in the field, although they're very good at examining one precise aspect of education, perhaps an aspect that has been neglected or overlooked in teaching practices for some time. Nevertheless, these same thinkers seem to have a kind of blindness for other things that are equally, if not more, important. I want us to read Jacques Maritain's Education at the Crossroads in order to ad address this problem. Maritain is a thoughtful writer, ladies and gentlemen. French-Canadian, or not French-Canadian, sorry, he's a French-Catholic writer who lived from 1882 to 1973. Um, but he's nonetheless someone you can read and appreciate not yourself being a Catholic or having any religious affiliation whatsoever. In his time, Maritain authored more than 60 books. He helped to revive appreciation for the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. And he was an important figure in the development and drafting of the UN's 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I want us to read Maritain together because I think his writings on education are very well balanced, accepting of what is good about modern-day progressive education, while at the same time insightful enough to articulate valuable suspicions about the route that progressive education has taken, and, in more, and moreover able enough to help us rediscover some of the precious things that have been left behind, rejected and forgotten from ancient times that are still absolutely vital to genuine education in the 21st century. I think that you'll, you'll find in Maritain someone who helps address the hollowness and the flatness of what perhaps you have felt in thinkers like John Dewey or René Descartes. I hope you'll come away from studying Maritain feeling in some way revivified and energized in your own thoughts about how precious and significant teaching and education can be, not just for your students, but for you as well. For we all share a common human nature that has great heights and depths in need of understanding. Now, Mary Tam finds much that is positive in the writings of men like John Dewey, in the progressive educational approaches that he spawned, and that are being implemented in school reforms even to this day. For instance, Mary Tam is a strong advocate of what is now called interdisciplinary learning or I guess interdisciplinary studies, right? As opposed to the more traditional balkanization of disciplines within their own isolated subject matters. He's also a big fan of the laboratory approach to teaching, where kids are encouraged and taught how to inquire into their own questions, rather than handed, canned, or simulated questions by the teacher. I don't think Mary Tan... Uh, would have too many issues with the kind of inquiry-based learning that's taking hold in schools nowadays in this regard. And like Dewey, he also looks to education as the prime means of developing good democratic citizens. In his view, school isn't so much about teaching a person how to do something as it is about learning how to be who we are which happens in relation to all the other people around us who are also charged with coming to know themselves as well, after all. Indeed, coming to know oneself, as we shall see for Maritain, means coming to know the meaning of one's own personhood, who one is as a person. And not just knowing oneself as a person, but seeing how each individual around us in society with us, is also a person. That 
in relation to these other people, we bear certain responsibilities and that certain rights are afforded to everyone on the basis of this discovery, which is grounded in our awareness of natural law. Now there's much good to be found in modern day educational developments in Maritain's eyes. He has positive things to say, for instance, about the value of educational psychology. He praises men like Jean Piaget for the careful and attention, uh, the caref careful attention that they've given to understanding how children develop. Maritain recognizes <clears throat> that the insights of educational psychology have fruitfully enriched our abilities as teachers to respond to the needs of our students. He also has much praise for educationists like Maria Montessori for taking care to try to see the children in front of them as spiritual beings, for trying to know and to nurture their inner vitality, and for being concerned to understand something about their development. He voices considerable praise for progressive educators because of how they demonstrate improved attention towards their students. He similarly lauds such progressives for recognizing and addressing the social or cooperative aspects of their learning, for making schools more hands-on and more experientially relevant and meaningful to children. He thinks it's a wonderful step forward that teachers are now being taught in teachers' colleges to adapt their educational methods in order to correspond with the natural interests of students. I don't think it's wrong to say that for Maritain. The education of teachers is equally as important as the education of students in this regard. If anything, I think he would support and advocate for more meaningful PD for teachers, as well as for more prep or planning time for us, so that we can continue to learn, to challenge ourselves, and to develop new vivifying lessons for our students. Indeed, Maritam bemoans how overworked and overburdened teachers are, writing, It is preposterous to ask people who lead an enslaved life to perform a task of liberation, which the edu educational task is by essence. Unquote. Hence, Maritain would very, much, very likely have much to say about the workloads, the immense class sizes, and the never-ending administrative work that teachers have to deal with nowadays. Things that detract immensely from what is key in all good teaching. Namely, the ability of teachers to give attention to their pupils. As Maritain writes, the most precious gift in an educator is a sort of sacred and loving attention to the child's mysterious identity, which is a hidden thing that no techniques can reach. Unquote. However, apart from these sorts of basic agreements with progressive educators and pragmatists who, to this day, rule over educational thought and monopolize the training of teachers, Maritain parts company with them in various interesting ways. If I were pressed to localize the essential distinction between Maritain and those who are in charge of things today, I would say that this difference lies in Maritain's insistence on genuine education being still about the pursuit of wisdom and the love of truth. As we have already seen, truth seems altogether too grand and lofty a word for men like Dewey, who eschew its use entirely, preferring instead the term warranted assertability. Indeed, speaking about truth implies that the human mind can actually touch what is, that we can come to know what is, for truth is always the truth about something, namely reality. Moreover, if human beings can, despite our dimness and imperfections, come to know what is through our searching, then metaphysical speech and metaphysical searching or questioning do in fact have some bearing upon the way we live. Hence the desire to know reality as such is not all futility and moonshine. Maritain's passion for truth is matched equally by his desire for wisdom. 
he would contend that wisdom, while being, as Pythagoras said long ago, a possession of God alone, nonetheless remains a meaningful word for us. Humans may still be lovers of wisdom, and inasmuch as we are, we do in fact participate in something divine. I suggest that these two things, the penchant for truth and the love of wisdom, are major differences between Maritain and the progressive educators who populate teachers' colleges and who fashion education policy today, ladies and gentlemen. These differences are part of what makes Maritain sound so peculiar and out of place when he writes things like, Education is by nature a function of philosophy, of metaphysics, and nobody can do without philosophy. Unquote. What? If any teacher's college anywhere in the country actually believed that, then why would all of them have gutted teacher education of its philosophic content and replaced it with courses in pedagogy, in curriculum design, in education technology, essentially in courses on technique? Indeed, Maritain, quite against the grain, calls for a renewal of metaphysics in education. With a philosophic spirit, he writes that, quote, the primary goal of education is the conquest of internal and spiritual liberty, to be achieved by the individual person, or, in other words, his liberation through knowledge and wisdom, goodwill and love. Unquote. The world, Maritain observes, will never be wise, but at least it can be aware that it needs wisdom. In his view, it is the deepest task of the educator to prepare human beings for wisdom. As preparation of this kind, education must foster the fundamental dispositions that will enable students to grow in the life of the mind. Now, <clears throat> such an education implies the cultivation of a kind of freedom too. <coughs> but not freedom in the sense Austin Powers uh, uses the word when he says, it's all about freedom, baby. That is, what Maritain means by freedom is definitely not freedom to do whatever you want when you want it, to buy whatever you want when you want it, to watch or listen to whatever you want, or to say what you want because you feel like saying it. Freedoms of this kind we pretty much take for granted in our part of the world, these are the freedoms we already daily enjoy in our own Canadian or North American liberal democratic society, after all. These freedoms are the liberal democratic backbone of our society, really. Whatever you or I have come to feel might be the source of our own happiness. Um, our right to pursue that thing is constitutionally entrenched and protected. To the extent, of course, that our seeking it does not unfairly or unreasonably interfere with the ability of others to likewise pursue their own vision of what will make them happy. And most certainly, these freedoms are important aspects of the way of life that we affirm en masse. But they are not what Maritain means by freedom. And personally, although I too have taken ample advantage of these multitudinous freedoms and Although I have surely enjoyed many of the benefits of living in our free and democratic society where every whim and every drive might with some little effort find its satiation, although this is the case, looking back on all the things I've had and done, I'm not at all too sure about how happy or fortunate such freedoms have made me in the long run or in the big picture. I guess... I'm left feeling a bit perplexed in the way that a philosopher might feel when he pursues wisdom in this or that vision of the good, only to find that he has come up empty-handed, yet still with that deep hunger for it in his heart. Indeed, I feel a deep resonance in Maritain's words when I read him saying, quote, Education is education for freedom, and the world within which it has to fulfill its duties, is sick with a frustrated longing for freedom and beauty, 
and has unlearned the primary conditions and requirements of freedom. Unquote. Something has gone awry with us, ladies and gentlemen. Something in the kind of freedom we have become so adept at pursuing and at exercising has at the same time caused us to forget about a deeper sort of freedom that relates us to goodness and a beauty that transcends all these other doppelgangers. But what is that freedom? The freedom that Maritain is talking about here <clears throat> is a kind of freedom from ourselves, really. See, the freedoms I've just enumerated for you, the Austin Powers freedoms, are all concerned with you being able to do successfully what you want when you want it. Your education all these years in school has primarily been aimed at finding out or discovering what you like best, what are your interests, what are your aptitudes, and then giving you the means and the wherewithal to pursue those things to your heart's content. Education is, in this regard, mostly a means towards the multitudinous ends put to us by our own diverse inclinations, or perhaps bequeathed to us by our parents, or by societal expectations and conventions. Or maybe these ends are dictated even more arbitrarily to us by wholly impersonal forces like job market prospects and competitive business trends. At any rate, this instrumental sort of education is very much akin to the sophistic education we've already explored in our readings from Isocrates, where, you'll recall, he talks about schooling as a means to feed our pleonexia, that is, education as a means to feed our insatiable hunger, to secure our birthright as winners and as succeeders, to, se to seize our own advantage, whether that be as individuals or collectively as a democratic body. Maritain has identified the general character of such an education as follows, I quote, There are people who think that it is wonderful to have a mind that is quick, clever, ready to see pros and cons, eager to discuss, and to discuss anything, and who believe that such a mind is that to which education must give scope, regardless of what is thought about, what is discussed, and how important the matter is. These people are unaware that if they succeeded in making such a conception prevail, they would at best transform universities into schools of sophistry. Unquote. <clears throat> and not just universities, ladies and gentlemen, but schools too, most certainly. For when no end beyond the immediate or tentative ends chosen for particular problems or particular invest investigations can be entertained, say, as in how Dewey prohibits our involvement in the consideration of what he calls the external ends or telloi of the ancient and medieval classical thinkers. Well, at most, what we have is an education system not for freedom, but for slavery. That is, slavery to our own diverse drives, passions, ideas, and ambitions. Whatever we spy is relevant to the immediately problematic situation, this becomes our tentative end, for which we seek out a means. Or by extension, whatever considerations of a future problematic situation strike us, by means or by their looming before us distressingly in the present, these two might then stand as tentative ends for our current concerns and investigations of means. Indeed, technological civilization is most assuredly about finding more effective and efficient means of accomplishing the goals, purposes, or ends put to us by the desires and ambitions we seek to gratify in the exercise of our liberal democratic freedoms. Indeed, if there might be a major distinction uh, that creates the greatest contrast between modern technological societies such as our own and the societies of long ago, I'd say 
it would have something to do with our fascination today with means over ends, with technique, and most certainly with technology. This emphasis in all likelihood has something to do with how in modern society we've sadly given up on the idea that we can know what is, or that metaphysical searching, inquiry, or zetasis matters. The great Canadian philosopher George Grant wrote most insightfully about the meaning of technology and the modern technological mindset when he pointed out how this neologism, technology, actually puts together two very powerful human powers, or human capacities, I guess, in a most novel manner. The word technology comes from two Greek words, techne and logos. Techne means art. To the Greeks, an art is some manner of making that human beings involve themselves in, in order to bring about the good of a thing. So, for instance, medicine is the art of making sick bodies healthy. Or farming is the art of bringing bounty from the earth. Or carpentry is the art of house building. The other root word, logos, has all kinds of rich meanings. For instance, it can mean simply word, or it can mean speech. It can also refer to the faculty of reason. So, Grant says, this new word of ours, technology, is very strange because of what it suggests about the relation between knowing, logos, and making, techne. Technology puts these two root words together in a way unimaginable to our Greek forefathers, for it implies that we only come to know a thing by making it. We cannot know what we have not made. Namely, what the Greeks spoke of when they used the word cosmos to describe the good order of being. Nor can we know the ground of being, for neither of these things have we made. Rather, we can only know what we have made or, or what we have mastered through our making in the integrated arts, sciences, and technologies. The only way to relate to the world as a knower, in other words, is by making the world into what we desire, by treating it as an object of our devices. Now, I admit that at times when I read Maritain, I feel like he too fails in some deep way to escape from this technological mindset, for it runs deeper than modernity. <clears throat> Maritain is correct to note that it does not jibe at all with the Greeks. It rather originates from Christianity, and in particular, in the divine command issued in the book of Genesis to hold dominion over the earth, to fill it and subdue it. I think similar dangers exist in the Christian theological notion of man being made in the image of God, when that image is, for whatever reason, equated with God as creator or maker. Nonetheless, these difficulties aside, Maritam most clearly recognizes the dangers of our modern-day technological mindset. Having lost sight of the final end, or telos, that is known not through an attitude of domination, but rather by contemplation, by lovingly gazing upon what is, the technological mindset is wholly caught up in the development of means to ends, of novelty and techniques, of ever more efficient manners of making, and therefore also promotes the sort of education that we now require of our young people in order to further this form of social order. Maritain writes, this supremacy of means over end and the consequent collapse of all sure purpose and real efficiency seems to be the main reproach to contemporary education. The means are not bad. On the contrary, they are generally much better than those of the old pedagogy. The misfortune is precisely that they are so good that we lose sight of the end.
So modern progressive technological education, therefore, beca perhaps because of how its excellences and means fascinate us, has made us slaves to ourselves. Our awareness of the forces we have unlocked by means of our technological mindset gives us a great feeling of power, what the ancient Greeks would have called hubris. But this hubris has in turn distracted us from paying mindful attention to the metaphysical reality of the ultimate end that underlines all general, genuine education, which Maritain contends most deeply concerns the fulfillment of the human beings, of human beings as persons. The manner in which Maritain uses the word person here is very important to understanding his argument, by the way. <coughs> we'll return shortly to this point. So to Merit, uh, let's go back to Maritain's vision of education for freedom. The freedom of which he speaks is not the same as those freedoms we find ensconced in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms or the American Bill of Rights. Certainly these doc documents are beautiful, but the freedom Maritain speaks about is more fundamental. Indeed, we can have and exercise all of these other chartered rights and freedoms, but without cultivating the freedom he speaks about in education at the crossroads, we find that none of them ever contribute greatly to our human happiness. That human happiness continues to be an elusive, chimerical beast. The kind of freedom of which Maritain speaks, that freedom from ourselves, is, classically speaking, the aim of a liberal arts education. For those of you who do not know already, the liberal arts are called liberal, free, or liberating arts because they are designed to free us from ourselves and in particular from our ignorance. When we pursue the liberal arts, we are said to do so out of love for the truth and nothing but the truth. We don't do it, the story goes, for marks or for money, for a job or for a claim. We don't do it because there's a reward or out of self-regard, but out of regard for the truth. This is actually where we get the notion of disinterested study, or disinterested truth from. Dewey tends to disparage it because he says that all knowing and all real education is der derived from the cultivation of interest, which makes sense. But he's actually missing the essential point in his criticism. See, what's meant by disinterested study isn't just going through the motions of school without any care for what you're learning. Nor, as some would have it, does it mean the cold, heartless objectifier of the world, someone who stands apart from it dispassionately vivisecting it. Nope. The real meaning of disinterested study is that we're studying not to stroke our own egos or for any personal gain, but solely out of concern for the truth. The real beauty of such study is that it is selfless and that it cultivates selflessness. That it is an act of humility to serve the truth so purely. True study, as we discussed it in an earlier lecture, arises when the ego is left behind. When we stop thinking about ourselves for a moment. When we lose ourselves in whatever we are studying. When the mind and the mind's object become one. True study, and here the Latin word is studium, is a form of self-transcendence. It's a spiritually purifying activity. Classically, beginning in rough with the Pythagoreans and then developing during the entire medieval period, there were seven liberal arts. These seven were divided into a group of three arts concerned with beauty and truth and speech, namely grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic, as well as four mathematical arts, namely 
arithmetic, <coughs> music, geometry, and astronomy. Mary Tang takes the form of the seven medieval liberal arts curriculum, but transforms and modernizes it. He speaks of the need for a few pre-liberal pre -liberal arts that all students would study during high school, these being grammar, logic, and languages, as well as history and geography. Then during college, all students would be exposed to a trivium, that's the three, right? In which they would study the art of creative and thoughtful expression, also called eloquence, literature and poetry, as well as art, fine arts, tech, uh, mechanical art, and technology. Their studies in this new trivium would be complemented by additional studies in a new quadrivium composed of mathematics, physics and natural sciences, the human sciences, like anthropology and the history of culture, and philosophy. Maritain comments that the object of basic liberal education, something he thinks all human beings living in a free and democratic society should enjoy, is not the mastery of science itself or art itself, nor is it the acquisition of intellectual virtues involved in each, but rather the grasp of their meaning and the comprehension of the truth and beauty they yield, a grasp of which natural intelligence is capable and for which it thirsts." Unquote. In Maritain's own words, the guiding principle in a good liberal arts education should be less factual information and more intellectual enjoyment. Education for Maritain is only fully human when it is liberal, liberating, or freeing education. When it prepares youth to exercise their power to think in a genuinely free and liberating manner. That is to say, when it equips them for truth and makes them capable of judging according to the worth of evidence, of enjoying truth and beauty for their own sake, and of advancing when they have become adults toward wisdom and some understanding of those things which bring them, bring them intimations of immortality." Unquote. Mind you, such an education for freedom is not all rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> we take it for, f for granted in our liberal democratic society that we're all born free. But we're not really free. And it's hard work to become free. As Maritain writes, man is not born free save in the basic potencies of his being. He becomes free by warring upon himself and thanks to many sorrows, by the struggle of the spirit and virtue. By exercising his freedom, he wins his freedom, so that at long last a freedom better than he, is ex he expected is given him. From the beginning to the end, it is the truth that liberates him. Interestingly, Maritain's language here about the need for a struggle and warring upon oneself is true to the original and proper meaning of the Islamic notion of jihad. Before that word became polluted and mangled and forever ruined by religious terrorists, it simply meant precisely this sort of inner struggle, this inner battle, that we all must undergo in the name of what is true and for the purposes of cultivating our inner, inner freedom. The Catholic philosopher and the United Nations human rights spokesman Jacques Maritain is, in this respect, in full agreement with practitioners of the Muslim faith. But now, we need to backtrack a bit in order to better understand what Maritain means when he speaks about the need for an education aimed at freedom. Again, we're very familiar in our part of the world with a certain well-accepted meaning of freedom, namely that freedom has to do with us being able to do what we want when we want it. But this sort of freedom, uh, this other sort of freedom that Maritain is talking about, essentially is a freedom from those very wants, 
the ones that drive us to want what we want when we want it. And that sounds very strange indeed. What's Mary Tan talking about here? In order to understand his thoughts in this regard, we have to get some better sense of the distinction he makes between personality, on the one hand, and individuality, on the other. But before we get to that, let me give you a quick little lesson in the etymology of that word person, where it comes from. The history of this word is actually a little surprising and counterintuitive. But what's weird in its history is also what's most revealing and enjoyable about the insights it discloses. See, our, person, our word person <coughs> actually comes from the Greek word prosopeion, which means mask. In ancient times, you'd go to the dramatic festivals held throughout the year in honor of the god Dionysus. There'd be comedies and tragedies for you to attend, and each of the actors would wear a special mask so as to res assume the personality of a specific character on stage. Now, of course, what strikes us as weird or counterintuitive about this etymology is that when we think of personality, we don't think at all of it as a mask, as something false or surface level that we put on as an appearance. Quite the opposite. We think of our own personality as what makes us really ourselves. Our personality is not a facade. It's not a disguise. How strange, then, for a word to take on such a meaning so contrary to its original one, eh? How'd that happen? Well, here's how I see it, ladies and gentlemen. Although its etymology points us towards the Greeks, we've inherited our use of the word person not so much from the Greeks of the ancient theater, but rather from Christian theology. When the Christians adopted this word from the Greeks, it originally didn't apply to human beings, but instead to God. Remember, God's understood classically in Christian terms as this fundamental mystery that's wholly and completely one, but also three. Three persons in one substance, as they say. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Here, I suggest, is where our notion of personhood truly originates. The three persons of the Trinity are kind of like the masks of the one God. These masks reveal the various aspects of the divine to human beings. God is a holy transcendent Father. God is Son, as Word and Founder of creation, as a source of reason, or the Logos, and as Savior. And God is imminent in the world, as wholly transcendent, yet permeating all things, including the hearts of men. These three persons of the Trinity are the peculiarly Christian manner of speaking about the deepest, most mysterious reality of things, ladies and gentlemen. So too, when this word person is secondarily applied to human beings, for human beings as persons are said to be made in the image of God. And as Maritain suggests, human personality is a great metaphysical mystery, unquote. For Maritain, then, the teacher's task of liberation through education involves centering our pedagogical attention on the in inner depths of the child's personality and its pre-conscious dynamism. Now, let's hone in a bit more stringently upon Maritain's understanding of person and why seeing the person and liberating each individual's personhood is the essential nature of all genuine education. Maritain writes, Man is a person who holds himself in hand by his intelligence and his will. He does not merely exist as a physical being. There is in him a richer and nobler existence. He has spiritual super-existence through knowledge and love. He is thus in some way a whole, not merely a part. He is a universe unto himself, 
a microcosm in which the great universe in its entirety can be encompassed through knowledge. And through love, he can give himself freely to beings who are to him, as it were, other selves. And for this relationship, no equivalent can be found in the physical world. This notion of the person that Maritain articulates, incidentally, corresponds <coughs> very well with what we've already seen in Plato's image of the human being as a microcosmos, or a little universe. Remember the earlier lecture on Plato's Mino, and in particular, what was said there about recollection or anamnesis? Essentially, that human beings learn through remembering what they themselves have always been by virtue of their participation in all that is. As themselves, little universe is capable of becoming conscious and therefore knowing all that is. Booper suggests a similar thing when he discusses the I-Thou relationship that we might cultivate with others and with the world around us. If I were, to, if I were asked to pinpoint a difference between Maritain on the one hand and Martin Buber and Plato, on the other hand, I'd say that it would lie in how far they are willing to extend this notion of personhood, or of a thou, that can be recognized in all things. Now, I may be wrong here, but I sense that for Maritain, the notion of person, inasmuch as it is what constitutes man's imago dei, or is what makes us each images of the divine, that personhood is a specifically human quality, and therefore is solely recognizable in ourselves and in other humans. I don't think, in other words, that Maritain, given his Christian understanding, would afford personhood to a tree, as Buber might, or to animals, or to inanimate objects, as Plato might, given the Platonic myths weaved about the transmigration of souls and various among his dialogues. Nonetheless, this spiritual aspect of our being is what constitutes our personality. As Maritain puts it, <clears throat> the notion of personality involves wholeness and independence. To say that a man is a person is to say that in the depth of his being, he is more a whole than a part and more independent than servile. It is this mystery of our nature which religious thought designates when it says that the person is the image of God. A person possesses absolute dignity because he is in direct relationship with the realm of being, truth, goodness, and beauty, and with God. And it is only with these that he can arrive at his complete fulfillment. <coughs> Mind you, Mary 10 points out that personality is only one pole of our being. The other pole he calls our individuality, whose prime root is matter. Quote, the same man, the same entire man who is in one sense a person or a whole made independent by his spiritual soul is also in another sense a material individual, a fragment of a species, a part of the physical universe, a single dot in the immense network of forces and influences, cosmic, ethnic, historic, whose laws we must obey. His very humanity is the humanity of an animal, living by sense and instinct as well as by reason. Thus, a man is a horizon in which two worlds meet. Here we face that classical distinction between the ego and the self, which both Hindu and Christian philosophies have emphasized. Unquote. If this distinction between the personality and the individuality is murky for you, let me explain it a bit. The basic insight <coughs> here is that, on the one hand, when we live from day to day, we experience ourselves externally as bodies having sensation, and internally, we identify ourselves with all of our fluctuating inner movements of soul, our passions, and our thoughts, etc. Maritain calls this our field of instincts. We experience fear, or desire, anger, or sadness. 
we identify with our dreams and aspirations, our thoughts and our opinions. And yet all of this stream of consciousness isn't really real. All the major faith traditions tell us so. This flux of psychomental states that we take to be the real thing, this ego, is not us. Nothing there resides. And we suffer a whole bunch, mainly because we take our fluctuating ego to be something that it is not. And not only that, when we teach in schools, and we encourage our students to come to know themselves, very often all we're concerned with is that they come to know this ego aspect of themselves. What do you like? What are your interests? What do you want to be when you grow up? How can we help you to be successful in the attainment of these things that you desire in your goals? This ego aspect is what Maritain refers to as the individual. It is one pole of our human nature. And the one that is perhaps most familiar to us in everyday life. But this ego is not our true self. To identify with these psychomental states is to misapprehend one's true nature. Indeed, our attachment to this shifting, transient aspect of our nature is the root of delusion, of pride, and selfishness. Only by loosening the hold that pride and selfishness have over us can we come into a fuller consciousness of who we truly are, what Maritain calls the pre-conscious spirit in man or what the Hindu Upanishads mean by tat fam asi, or thou art that. And what thou art is precisely that person pole, that Atman, or that imperishable, immortal soul that is also Brahman, the one God that completely transcends and yet permeates all things. Maritain correctly identifies this doctrine as both Hindu and Christian. But, really, it's a pan-religious insight that's recognized in all the world's mystical and contemplative traditions. For another perspective on the meaning of these two poles, think back now to our brief readings earlier from the philosopher Eric Vogelin. Vogelin's writings are very much in agreement with Maritain about these two poles and their significance for understanding the nature of our existence as both persons and individuals. However, Vogelin uses classical Greek terms, where Maritain prefers Christian ones. In Vogelin's view, when we seek to know ourselves, we must take pains to awaken ourselves to full consciousness of our existence as beings in between these poles of death and deathlessness, of ignorance and knowledge of what he calls the, um, the mortal unlimited and the immortal beyond. What does he mean by this? Where well, Maritain says the egoic flux of our individuality has its prime root in matter, Vogelin speaks instead of the apeiron, or the mortal unlimited. This ancient term, apeiron, was actually coined by the pre-Socratic philosopher Anaximander. The word apeiron signified for the Greeks the inexhaustibly creative ground that was thought to release things into being and to receive them back when they perished. Think of the apeirontic depths like a giant ocean of change and fluctuation in which we all participate as fluctuating things ourselves. Or consider it like the entire form of the universe all at once, out of which we rise for a short time, and back into which we submerge only an instant later. For after all, human life is as brief as a flash of lightning in the grand scheme of things. The Aperon is the pole we intimate when we become aware of the passing nature of things, when we recognize our mortality and how nothing lasts. But it's only one pole, after all. The other pole, Plato referred to as the One, or Ta-Hen. 
It's the eternal ground pole. Alternatively, Vogelin notes, <coughs> Plato also refers to this pole using the word epikena, which literally means the immortal beyond. Vogelin points out that the human or that human existence is lived and experienced as a tension between these two poles. Moreover, it's clear that from what Plato has written, that neither pole in this tension can be known independently of or apart from the tension hypostatically, as though it were a real objective thing. Perhaps here you recall reference to this danger from our study in Descartes. Remember how this hardening of spiritual experiences into reified objects was the main reason why metaphysics started to look so ridiculous in the Middle Ages, and why skepticism and atheism subsequently arose as fortune or forces in modern philosophic writing. No, these two poles are not things that can be known on their own. They are only recognized as far as we are able to experience them in the tension that we feel through being pulled in each of their directions. Moreover, although happily our desire to know what Plato called Eros can take us noetically to the extremes in this tension, it's important to remember that this tension itself can never be resolved in human life.